So it began the chat with Wayne, which we recorded a little earlier, by just saying congratulations, International Coach of the Year, and immediately you deferred, paid tribute to the other coaches and said that they probably deserved it more than you, which I know you well enough to know that that's utterly genuine. You absolutely meant it. That's how you felt, mate. Yeah, like I always... We're in a team sport, aren't we? And it's always awkward, I reckon, when they hand out individual prizes. understand why, but... Um, you know, and you can never do justice to the people who have helped you get there. You know, it's, it's, it's never one person, it's never a few people, it's a it's a team and you just can't do it justice. So I always find it a bit uncomfortable, but um, you know, that's just me. It's a hell of an honour though, mate. I mean, that's the great thing about it. And it just also continues the momentum and the euphoria as well. So it must be a great feeling. And especially watching the girls win as well. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I think the best thing about it, it actually shines a bit of a light on on women's rugby and our women in particular. And you know, they've they've been magnificent. There's, there's no doubt about that. They've bought into a like a, a game that was um, risky and full of attack. We decided as a team that's the only way we could possibly win the tournament or even compete in the tournament was to not follow what everyone else was doing. They bought into that, but then you got a then you've got to um, learn the skills and have the courage to, to play it. And so I think that spotlight's well and truly on them for doing that and for entertaining the country and for showing their personalities. So of that, yeah, we're all really proud. When you took the job and you've, and, you know, and amidst everything that had happened in that, you go in there, you go into that first training camp and you're staring at a bunch of faces and was there ever a, a thought that you thought, wow, well, you know, I want them to buy into what I'm saying. I want them to, you know, I want them to embrace what I'm trying to do here. But maybe it won't happen. Was there ever a doubt in your mind? There's always a bit of doubt because um, what we've been doing is different to what they've been taught previously in, in their lives. Even our kicking strategy um, is a bit weird, but I don't think it's weird. No. <laughs> I, I hate box kicks. You know, like it's a box kick to me is throwing up a grenade and, and hoping that something good comes from it. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm really adamant on getting rid of box kicks and using kicks that go either directly to us, like a pass or um, or hit some deck, you know, kick to where the seagulls are because where the seagulls are, there's no people. And right. it just makes sense to me that you, that's the way you put pressure on teams. So a lot of the ideas were different and... Um, yeah, I don't think it took too long to get by, and these are really smart women. I think they could see the logic in what we were trying to do and understood that we did need to change to give ourselves an opportunity. You know, you talked about using the ball and finding space and having the courage and all of that, and I go back to, I think it was the very first move of that second half where we scored that glorious try. I think Stacey scored it, and and it was just the the quality of the passing. There were twenty five metre passes being thrown. They were right into the bread basket. You know, or just that skill level. And as you say, the confidence to, em- to embrace the fact that hey, I've trained. I-, I can do this, and the passes can stick. Yep, yep. Um, it looks like flair, doesn't it? But it's it's not. It's been hard work, um, working on efficiency, being able to pass closer to the opposition, um, pass off either foot take the, the backwards swing out of the passing, get closer, you know, all those sorts of things. And so what looked like flair was actually hard work and efficiency camouflaged as flair. And it's um, something that I'm really proud of because it's not easy and these women worked really hard at it. Not only that, they eventually we got to the point where they were seeing the attacking opportunity in situations that no one else was seeing. And so we attacked from what looked like risky situations, but they'd seen the opportunity and often we scored from them. So it was, yeah, it was a pretty amazing feat by the women, you know, all 32 of them. It was pretty amazing, really. Yeah, I just I just wanted to sort of embrace that skill, skill factor because, you know, it's easy to get caught up in the euphoria and the joy and, as you say, the personalities and the momentum that was created and everything. And I just don't want to, you know, ever forget that there's a really high level of rugby we were watching. Yeah, it was it was simple, but it was also difficult. Simple in the respect that we only had, like from left scrums on the left side of the field, we only had one play, but the play had four moves off it, so four options off it. 
same from midfield scrums and same from right side scrums. And it was really exciting. I think I think the girls appreciated the fact that we didn't have to learn a lot of moves. All we had to do was sense that we were in space. Like you don't want them looking for too much because they see nothing. If you if you if you ask players to look for everything, they'll see nothing. So getting them to feel that gee, I don't think I was marked there, and then just giving that feedback, giving a solution rather than a problem. So what I mean by that, instead of saying, look, the space out here, all that does is make everyone think. So, you, so making really specific calls. And that's what we, we became really good at, was um, was putting those simple philosophies into onto the field under pressure too, because, you know, this is a World Cup. Mm-hmm. And, it's, and it was only us that was playing like that. And it could have been a disaster. <laughs> Uh, but it wasn't. Wayne Smith with us. Uh, before we get on to, you know, I've got so many things to ask you, just about the emotion and the fun aspect and things like that. But, you know, against France, and we talked about this, there was a penalty right at the end and that last line out against England. These are margins, aren't they? And, you know, it's easy to kind of forget and get lost in the euphoria of a win and everything, but my God, that's tight. That's a tight way to win a World Cup. Yep, it was It was sort of like fate, really, wasn't it? Uh, two opportunities to lose those games but two opportunities also to win it you know and, and if you look at that kick from uh, there's really good refereeing in that French game because initially she was going to give the penalty up by the 22 and the TMO said no joy it's back towards the 10 metres just keep walking back and I'll tell you where it was and they used, used the TMO for a really positive <laughs> outcome for us <laughs> but then the play the play off that kick um, you know, for Kennedy Simon to catch it over a shoulder running backwards. And by the way, she had quickly tried to organise a lift, a hoist under the under the bar. She thought she thought for a second or two, maybe if I get lifted I could stop the ball going over. And then she thought, nah, probably not tall enough. So anyway, she caught it over her shoulder, um, was gonna make the pass to Porsche because of that sort of attacking instinct. <laughs> didn't made the contact and then the rest is history you know we we played out that last 10 seconds whatever it was mm. maturely and um won that game so yeah there's always a bit of luck and but but also you make that through your skill level you learned lots you said about yourself as much as everything about the coaching and everything so just from a human ex- experience is that i mean how important was that to you and how and how much how joyous is that to you yeah there's a there's clearly a big difference between the men's and the women's game, and I don't think we should try and even compare the two because it is different, you know, and, and hopefully with the professionalisation of the women's game, they have a uniqueness around what we do. And, and New Zealand Rugby, I think, have the, um, the intelligence to do that. So what I mean by that, you know, a lot of these women are going to be mums, they're often mums at a young age. Um, that means they can't play for a number of years or they might give up at an early age. They then need a career. So you've got to allow the professionalisation, I think, to take in all those, all those account of all those things. Mm. So pay them. You know, I think, I think at some point they should, there should be equity with some of the men's game. Probably not with what the All Blacks get paid, but certainly with, NPC or um, or Super Rugby levels, and but allow them to forge other careers at the same time. Allow them to be mums, and um, I think that would be a really balanced way to to look at the game. And for me, it was um, yeah, like people like Graham Henry and and Mike Cron and I, obviously of an older vintage. We weren't used to the laughter the fun oh we look used to the laughter but um the the build-up is based way but way more on joy and excitement rather than tenseness and and pressure and so they get rid of those other feelings through togetherness through music through laughter through joy and this is right through the week it's not just up till tuesday you know, it's right through the week, even on the bus to the game. There's a real level of excitement that I've never seen before, never experienced before. I'm used to sitting on the bus and it's and it's silent. Um, I preferred that at the start. By the end of it, I was, it's only 20 minutes to Eden Park, so I could put right. up with it. Yep. Uh, 
to me, at the start, it wasn't high performance, but I came to understand, yes, it is high performance for the women because they love what they're doing. They're taking every chance they get. And they basically they were basically um, representing our attacking um, attitude in the way they built up, I felt. So they didn't get too tied up, not too tight, um, not too emotional, and they were able to go out and play the game that we wanted to play, and they loved it. It's so perceptive of you it. to say that, mate, because, you know, I'm, I'm just thinking about, you know, going back to um, Twickenham, which you would have watched on the weekend. And, and look, the way we deal with the men's game is completely different. The way we analyse it, theorise it, criticise it is always going to be completely different. The way we feel and react to it is going to be completely different. I mean, we're all sitting here shattered and disappointed and thinking, what went wrong, All Blacks? How could you blow that? How could you choke that? You know, we don't, I mean, talking to Shag last week, I don't know whether we can we, whether we can bridge this gap, but they're just, the celebration and the fun and the joy is I don't know if it's lost for men's rugby, but, you know, Shag said we've got to somehow find a way to plug in that it's still a sport. It's still a game. It's still people running, chasing a piece of pigskin across the grass. What went wrong then, Smithy? We don't we don't laugh and have as much fun doing it, don't we? We don't. No, um, we don't. Like, the, the personalities in the men's game are just as good as in the women's game. And how that gets freed up, I'm not too sure. It's... Um, you see it early in a week, you don't see it late in a week. There's always a collective gasp from the crowd, um, a nervousness. Are we going to win? Are we going to win? The expectation's huge. I think in our game, firstly, this was quite unique because I don't think anyone gave us a chance. And and I think if you had talked to Graham or, or Crono or, or Bunce or myself in those early days, we might have given ourselves a 1 in 10 chance, which wow. means we would have needed to a really good day to, to beat teams like like France and England. I think that changed a wee bit during the tournament, but there was still, I guess, a feeling that, look, we've been behind them. Um, we're behind them in a lot of areas. Professionalisation was one, but quality of play, quality of, um, you know, their skill level. But we were catching up quickly, and um, that's what made it exciting. I think... The crowds weren't necessarily rugby crowds. There were a lot of kids exactly there. Exactly right. Of, exactly a lot right. Of women there. A lot mm. of families there. Yeah. Not as much um, booze being drunk as what I noticed, mate. You know. Yeah. Exactly. And and afterwards, there's no sort of criticism about, oh, what were you doing there? Why did you do that? You know, he nearly lost us the game. It was more just joy, and it was beautiful. It was beautiful to be a part of. Yeah, I loved. I loved being at the. You know, and I don't know. You know, I, I, know, I mean, men's rugby is not going to be like that, but I just wish sometimes that we'd all just take a, a back step and go, hey, this is our team that's playing out there. They're playing their hearts out for us. I mean, they're not going out there to play badly, drop balls, lose tries in the last second. Fozzie's not going out there to coach a losing side. You know, all of these things kind of get lost a bit, don't we? And, and, and Shag had no answers how we find it again, but maybe we find it again through our MPC or our club rugby, just start again from that level and actually make it, you know, try and make it a bit more fun. But, you know, something, see, when you go along to the ground, you're not going along to moan, you're going along because you're there to watch a game, of, a good game of code with your favourite players. Yeah, that's right. Um, look, I don't know what the answer is either, um, but I do know that we have got a lot of characters in the men's game and somehow that's, that's got to be allowed to come out and um, that's what, ignites people and connects them to, to the game mm. um, and perhaps as you know that the game has faltered at the community level as we know you know I'm at Waihe Beach here and at Waihe Athletic they're a great old rugby club um, not the numbers there that there used to be um, still a lot of passion but not you know not enough to you know to to be able to get huge numbers along so it's, a, it's an issue, same, same as at schools. You know, I look at Pataru High School. Um, when I was in the first 15, I only made it in the seventh form, you know, and I was probably about the sixth or seventh best player on the team. It, you know, it was a powerhouse. But now all those, if you're any good, you, you'll get you snapped up by another to one of those big schools. Exactly right. And I think that, and, and so they're professionalising the game early, and, and so those kids coming through are bound to have been taught how to be in the media, how to act, how important the game is, what professionalisation is. Um, maybe that's not the right way. Who takes over from you guys now, mate? Um, it's not Razor. Apparently, he's got a couple of other jobs in the pipe. And you know, and but and you know, and Whitney says it's not her. 
Um, so you know, is there somebody that's standing out? Does it, you know that 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 you know that you think that person should be the person? Well, I think there's an opportunity to keep some continuity. Um, so that to me would be Wes Clark and Whitney, and and the team, um, both really smart. Wes Clark's won a previous World Cup in 2017, been there a long time, coached different areas of the game. So he was our defence coach in this game, in, in this series. Um, but he's coached line out. He's he's done all sorts of areas. So to me, he would be an ideal choice. Um, and then there are some women coming through, like Crystal Kawa from um, who's got the Chiefs mana with this this year as head coach. Um, she's had an outstanding career. Started women's rugby or drove women's rugby at Hamilton Girls High to be the best in the world in her reign. Um, there's Victoria Grant, who's a Pataru woman. She's head coach. Yeah, we spoke to Vicky. Yeah, she's in Wellington, yeah. In yeah. Power. Yeah. yeah, so there's these um, women coming through that clearly are going to have the ability to become head coaches. So involvement of them under Wes initially and then um, moving them into those top jobs, I think, would be outstanding. And what we've got to do is also, I just think we've just got to be a little bit realistic and gentle about it, finally, in that we don't know next year whether that 45,000 crowd is going to turn up and watch Farah Palmer Cup or the Opiki competition. We don't know yet. We don't know if the Black Ferns only playing Australia, what kind of crowd that they're going to get. Can they sell tickets at a higher price? All those kind of things. But I just hope people just remember what we've got at the moment, that surely this is able to be built upon. And it is a slow burn. It doesn't all happen straight away. But what it actually proves is that that game's exciting and the women are fantastic and, and people love them and they want to see them. And so, you know, it's it's all sitting there is what I'm trying to say, isn't it? Yeah, um, you'd, you'd like to think that there'll be a price difference in the games and that people, families can continue to go. So you're trying to get, um, you're trying to get kids there, trying to get young girls there to, to these games. You've got to keep the price low. And you've probably got to look at the timing of the game. So 7.30 was an ideal, understood you know, global audience and, and pinnacle event. Um, but, you know, I've got a three-year-old granddaughter who couldn't come to the semi-final or final because it was too late for her, whereas my grandson was able to come. He was six. Yep. Um, so I think little things like that keep the prices low, um, encourage those families to come because that's where the growth is going to be. Man, it's fantastic. I mean, what a ride. And what a ride. You know, and I love the fact that you put it down as one of the greatest things that you've ever done, because I know that you mean that. That's absolutely true. And, it, you know, isn't it wonderful at whatever stage you are in life that you can get surprised, you can surprise yourself and get surprised like that? It must be such a, such a cool thing to experience. Yeah, like we're lucky in this sport because, you're, you know, you're often surprised or surprised with Crusaders, you know, 98, 99, um, and that was a great experience. Um, had some couple of, you know, a few great years in Italy that I didn't expect to be as good as they were. Kobe recently in Japan. Um, you know, it's um, the, the game constantly surprises you and gives back to you, and you become ever grateful for it. This one was a true adventure with, honestly, a... a population of very very smart women who have had to fight hard to get where they are and so they're going to make the most of it you know they're not going to waste a minute they're going to make the most of what they've earned and you know that's what made it exciting and fun i think was um their their smartness their willingness to let their personalities come through and show that off to the nation i thought i thought it was uh, fantastic 